Hey what's up guys and welcome back to the channel. Today I decided to put together some of our previous videos into a lore compilation video all about Darth Vader himself, the most fearsome Sith that has ever lived. Darth Vader lore on the channel has been one of our favorite aspects to explore, so I hope that you can have this video on in the background and enjoy it while you're either cooking or running errands or whatever have you. And I hope you find these videos as compelling as I did, as we talk about and explore different pieces of interesting lore revolving around Lord Vader the Fallen Chosen One. And without further ado, let us begin. Greetings Acolytes, and welcome back to the channel. Often, we like to talk about the ancient Sith Lords and their unprecedented powers within the Force. They performed many bewildering marvels and terrifying feats in the Force that many modern Force sensitives, Jedi and Sith alike, can only dream of. Many of these abilities have fallen into legend and myth, however, although we do know that some of these Force abilities were no mere smuggler's tale, and that many of these ancient Sith were indeed powerful and capable of a great many dark and horrendous deeds. But having said this, it is worth noting that some of them did have help. Using an amalgamation of Sith sorcery, as well as alchemy, the ancients created a litany of cursed artifacts that they would wield or wear in order to augment their power and bring them closer to the dark side itself. These artifacts are often things we only read about in the books and tales of Star Wars lore, but do not often see in the modern renditions of the Sith Order. So why exactly is this? While there have been many accounts of Palpatine personally owning many artifacts that were imbued with dark side energies, it seems as though he was largely indifferent to these trinkets in comparison to the almost over-reliance that the ancient Sith seemed to have against them. So why is this? Why did the ancient Sith value these artifacts and trinkets so much when the modern Sith seem to barely take note of them? Well today, we hope to explore this and find out the truth and answer the question on why these more modern Sith Lords fell out of the use and practice of Sith artifacts. To start, let's take a look at some of the most valued artifacts themselves and visit a few examples of these artifacts that many Sith of the old empire were so productive with as well as highly protective of. The first 12 Dark Jedi who were the followers of Ajunta Pal were quite fond of these dark side artifacts which they ultimately plundered from the tombs of the Sith Purebloods, pure-blooded kings that had reigned before the Dark Jedi's arrival on Korriban and the Sith homeworld. These amulets and scrolls of power are what gave rise to the reinvention of Sith sorcery and alchemy as we now know it. One such person enamored with these objects was the Dark Jedi Sora Sin, who dedicated much of her time on Korriban exclusively to researching these Sith people, as well as the cursed artifacts that the ancestors wielded. Sin would study these artifacts intensely after looting them from the tombs of the old masters, and soon began to make her own for herself and for the dark Jedi compatriots by her side. She regarded even the minor amulets of the ancient Sith as priceless possessions. Such amulets included the Sith Avatar, which translate any language spoken or written, and attunes its wearer to the chattering of ancient ghosts. Sin attributes the relic for being the main conduit for the Dark Jedi to make contact with the Sith people and allow communication between the two groups. The Dark Jedi would fight each other over these various artifacts, believing again all of them to be priceless, such as one of the Dark Masters in Zozin seizing the yoke of seeming for himself. This Sith artifact projected an illusion to make their wearer appear as anyone or anything at the cost of it burning their skin while in use. Some of these artifacts were so powerful that it could make the user almost akin to a god, such as the Heart of Grosh. The Heart of Grosh was a fist-sized ruby that the dead King Grosh had placed within his own heart. When paired with the Helm of Grosh, the wielder can control the very forces of nature. What is clear about these artifacts is that they were created by these Sith purebloods that were so deeply ingrained in the dark side of the Force that it opened within themselves pathways to abilities and allowed them the construction of these various amulets and artifacts, a power that seems to be largely lost on the more modern Sith or even the Dark Jedi of this era. These appeared to be literal gifts from the dark side itself. 
However, despite the awe-inspiring nature of these powerful items, at some point in history, around the time of the Old Republic era, the use of these ancient Sith artifacts began to drastically decrease, as less and less Sith were seen in possession of them. We find one answer snug deep in the pages of the Darth Bane novel as to exactly why this is, and why the Sith stopped using these amulets and artifacts in general. In the novel, Darth Zana, Bane's apprentice, is looking over a collection of various dark side artifacts. The book says this, quote, She could still feel faint remnants of dark side energy clinging to them, fading memories of the incredible power that they once contained. The key here lies in the wording of these very sentences, faint remnants of dark side energy, fading memories of incredible power. From just this, we have the answer we need. The power of these Sith artifacts diminish over time, likely thousands upon thousands of years. By the time many of these objects reach the light of day, the spirits and power of their masters have long since vanished from the galaxy. And after several hundred years, the power of the artifact will slowly fade until it is little more than a paperweight. Not too many Sith were sentimental. Many Dark Lords were not very sentimental and did not desire to keep these items out of pure novelty. The Sith valued practicality and results, as well as instantaneous power. Much like the people in their lives, if the object didn't contain useful knowledge or power at the time, then it was quickly discarded. Of course though, the next immediate question is why didn't the Sith simply make more? The answer is a shift in philosophy for the Sith. In the time of the Old Republic, the Sith completely became militarized beings, and men like Darth Malgus were much less enamored with arcane knowledge and more focused on applying their skills to warfare. It is also worth mentioning that in Bane's time, when the Brotherhood of Darkness was the dominant force in the Sith Order, Lord Khan's philosophy was that every Sith Lord was equal to one another, hence why they abandoned the title of Darth. Crafting an amulet or possessing dark side artifacts might possibly be perceived as a challenge to other Sith Lords. Sith Lords who were essentially supposed to be equals, much like the Darth title which was basically one saying that they were the pinnacle of the Sith and thus inviting challenge. Creating a powerful dark side talisman might be constituted as one attempting to become greater than their Sith Lord brothers within the Brotherhood of Darkness. As for the Sith of the Bainite era, this was a different story. When it came to Sith alchemy and Sith sorcery, the modern Sith preferred to dedicate their knowledge to the study of destroying the Jedi, but destroying them was something much bigger than a personal ability booster. These amulets were created in a time when the Sith warriors desired as much personal power as possible in order to dominate the battlefield on their own as well as their domain. Modern Sith Lords though had no use for such ends as they were in hiding and not doing battle with the Jedi using their lightsabers. The battlefield was now entirely within the force itself, the galaxy at large, and it was a battle of wills and intelligence. Therefore, the rule of two Sith in the Bainite era saw little need to construct brand new talismans and Sith artifacts, as they viewed this as an ancient practice. When Palpatine rose to power, however, it seemed that he and Plagueis may have possessed and used a few dark side artifacts, but only ones whose power couldn't be discovered by the Jedi, so the manipulation had to be subtle and easily executed. However, this does mark an important event in Sith lore, as Plagueis and Palpatine did use these ancient artifacts. Plagueis was recorded as having some artifacts of his own, but not for power, merely for study. Darth Plagueis was far more interested in the science behind the four rather than the mysticism, and as such, he merely possessed amulets and objects to experiment on them. He wanted to know that if you slightly shaved away and chipped away at a crystal of dark energy, would its power diminish? Would it grow weaker? These questions endlessly drove Plagueis' research, but it is unknown if he ever used one of them for his own personal gain. Sidious, on the other hand, hardly had any use for these artifacts within his own exploits, and when he rose to power as the Emperor, he had no use for them at all, as Sidious believed that he no longer had anyone left to challenge him in the wide galaxy. Despite this though, Sidious did inherit many Sith artifacts from Plagueis, and did retain some interest in them, if only for his own amusement, as he made it somewhat of a hobby out of collecting these dark side mementos, and even gave one to Darth Vader himself as a gift. 
This, of course, in canon, was the helmet of Darth Maumon. Speaking of Vader, as for him, he had no interest in dark side treasures whatsoever unless they strictly aligned with his own goals. In fact, the helmet of Maumon was nearly instantly forgotten about by Vader until it came to life and the spirit of Maumon possessed one of the architects working on Vader's own castle, as he then proceeded to offer Vader something he could not refuse. If you want to know more about this story in particular, I suggest watching our video on why no one who worked on Vader's castle survived. Darth Vader did actually use one specific other artifact on a regular basis though, and he in fact took it with him almost everywhere that he went. This artifact was in fact his meditation chamber aboard his Star Destroyer. In Sin's diary in the Book of the Sith, again one of the first ever Dark Jedi, she details several dark side artifacts and actually includes the meditation chamber within her notes, as this technically does qualify as a dark side artifact. Her passage on this said this, this space-going vessel is not an amulet that one can grasp nor wear. It is an amulet that encompasses its possessor. The arcane geometrics of this vessel's cabin can amplify the passenger's spells a thousandfold in every single direction. You heard that correctly. Vader's meditation chamber in itself is a construction crafted by the dark side of the Force and therefore is technically a Sith artifact. As noted, the chamber amplifies the passenger's power a thousandfold whilst they are within it. This is likely why we saw Darth Vader able to force choke an Imperial officer despite them being aboard an entirely different starship. Well anyway friends, what did you think of today's video? If you were a Sith, do you think you would possess a dark side artifact of your own? And what are your thoughts on why they ultimately fell out of fashion for the Sith? Darth Vader is one of the most formidable Sith Lords in the history of the galaxy, and his reputation for hunting down and slaughtering Jedi Knights is largely unrivaled. As perhaps the most fearsome Jedi Butcher of his era, there were very few individuals who were ever able to survive an encounter with the Dark Lord of the Sith, let alone do any considerable damage to the Tyrant whatsoever. Despite this though, Vader was utterly crippled by his duel against Obi-Wan Kenobi in Revenge of the Sith on Mustafar. Left to die on the lava banks, he was confined to a life support suit which caused him immeasurable agony for the duration of his existence, and he had very little mobility or maneuver ability while within his combat gear. So this raises an important question. How was Vader able to overpower so many talented Jedi Knights? What made Vader so special that he could essentially march his way through virtually any opponent? Well, today, students of the Force, we will explore exactly why Vader was such a dangerous combatant and explore why his lightsaber form was directly tooled to fight Jedi as well as why Darth Vader may just be the greatest fundamental lightsaber duelist in the entirety of Star Wars lore. The four primary factors are of course Vader's chosen lightsaber style, his connection with the dark side, an ancient Sith practice known and employed by only a select few individuals called Dun Mok, and surprisingly the inexperience of most Jedi that he faced. Let's begin with Vader's chosen lightsaber form. As a Jedi Knight, Anakin Skywalker specialized in Form 5 to Gem So. The Gem So is the dueling variant of Form 5 lightsaber combat that Anakin utilized throughout the duration of the Clone Wars and had become very familiar with over the course of several long years. Originally, Anakin Skywalker actually specialized in Form 4, but later made the transition to Form 5 and its dueling centric variant. The Gem So focused on ending a fight before it could ever truly be allowed to begin. This was done by overpowering, disorienting, and defeating an opponent as quickly as possible. While similarities can be found in Ataru, otherwise known as Form 4, Ataru was far more acrobatic than Dejem So was. Instead, Dejem So truly highlighted Anakin Skywalker's greatness, as it focused on marching through obstacles with brute force, as Anakin was incredibly physically strong, which offered in turn Vader a previous mastery of the prior experience using the form. Vader being physically stronger than even Anakin, Kim. It was also applicable to his situation after being crippled by Obi-Wan. When Vader was confined to his suit, he lost much of his mobility, even losing the ability to lift his arms from above his head. 
For an Ataru user, this would nullify most of their training and efficiency in duels, as they would need to be flexible and mobile to truly reach the fullest extent of their capabilities. The Gem So, on the other hand, was a much more streamlined approach and didn't require much maneuverability at all, making it a prime choice for Vader given his circumstances. Had Anakin Skywalker actually stuck with Ataru, we may have seen a far less powerful and skilled Vader. Dejemso allowed Vader to keep most of his movements short and controlled, yet backed with his incredible strength and knowledge of the form. When combined with his prowess in the dark side and the fullest extent of his force potential, however, Dejemso became much more dangerous than ever under a trained Jedi. As Vader, of course, was no Jedi, Vader was a Sith. While Jedi were allowed to use forceful maneuvers, they were discouraged from ever tapping into their aggression and letting their anger drive a combat scenario, lest they run the risk of falling to temptation and turning to the dark side. If a Jedi dug into their own latent aggression, then the dark side became an increasingly dangerous presence for a Jedi who didn't have control over their emotions, as a duel surprisingly can actually lead to a Jedi embracing the dark side. Once on the dark side, however, such as Vader, Sith Lords were able to exert all of their hatred, their frustration, and their rage into a combat scenario, thus allowing Vader to repurpose his former Dejem So style, only now fully utilizing the dark side of the Force and allowing him to push himself further than he ever could as a Jedi. The Formum techniques of Form 5 paired very nicely with Vader's newfound ability to use his anger and his rage against former Knights of the Jedi Order, and it also allowed him to fight with his limited range of motion thus offering Vader the proper technique to channel his anger and compensate for his physical limitations. But what made Vader truly great and exceptional was not that he truly specialized and brought Dejemso to its absolute limit, but that he used other forms to bring Dejemso past its limits. Darth Vader was also a known practitioner of Sarisu, as he did not specifically specialize in Dejemso, but rather the greatness of Vader was that he combined several lightsaber forms into a hybridized style, a style that allowed him to mount an incredibly unbearable offensive front, and yet nearly instantaneously switch into a defense that was impenetrable. Inspired by the likes of his defeat at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi, Vader learned Sarisu extremely well, studying the form extensively, and perfecting Sarisu to the point where it could seamlessly protect all of the cybernetics that Darth Vader required to continue to live. Most importantly, his life support system, beyond Vader's incredible defense, though, was his second greatest teacher over the course of the Clone Wars, Count Dooku. As it has been stated before that besides Obi-Wan, it was Dooku that taught Anakin Skywalker and in turn, Darth Vader, the most about combat over the course of the Clone Wars. This is where Form 2 Makashi comes into play. Dejemso has been described as wild and uncontrolled, but having learned directly from the likes of Dooku, Darth Vader was able to refine it. No movement was wasted, and Vader too used the finesse of a Spencer, similar to his greatest opponent at the time, Dooku. It were these three key styles of Form 5 Dejem So, 3 Sarisu, and 2 Makashi that formed the perfect hybridized lightsaber form. Vader used his greatest defeats over his life and created a form that would butcher dozens of Jedi. But even this is not the end of Vader's greatness in a lightsaber duel, as again, he used the technique known as Dun Mok. He paired his lightsaber skills with this ability, using the two in tandem. Dun Mok was a method that the ancient Sith designed to overwhelm an opponent with a barrage of strikes and blows within a very few brief seconds of time. This would cause even a seasoned knight to hesitate, despite all their training, and this moment of hesitation was crucial in ensuring the duel most often led to the downfall of each and every Jedi, despite their skill level. Dun Mok, though, was far more than physical, as it allowed Vader to penetrate the Jedi's mind taunt them verbally and far, far more. Once Vader caused a Jedi to second guess and doubt their defenses and even their own skill in the Force, they were immediately thrust into the defense, not only physically, but within their very minds, as it was running on overdrive in order to compensate for the overwhelming experience of the Dark Lord. This automatically shifted a fight into Vader's favor, as he was able to dictate the course of the fight and the nature of who was on the offense and who was on the defense and when. The ancient Sith and Vader, long after them, trained themselves to terrify an opponent to the extent of making them forget their training completely. 
and all it took was one opening or moment of weakness to deliver the killing blow. Vader's imposing presence, demeanor, and stature already did most of the job for him, terrifying an opponent to the degree of making them hesitate and clouding their mind, numbing their instincts in the Force, and finally, overpowering them effortlessly. Many of the Jedi that perished at the hands of Vader were only conquered due to a brief moment of weakness and hesitation caused by his absolutely terrifying presence in the Force and demeanor combined with his unrivaled aggression. It's also important to note that very few Jedi ever had encountered another Force user in blade-to-blade -blade combat, which Dooku cited as a major weakness from the Jedi Order at the time. The Jedi simply had lost the ability to duel one another as there were far less Sith and Darksiders in the galaxy. Throughout the era of the Clone Wars, there were only a few ever prominent lightsaber wielders who ever opposed the Jedi, and many of them primarily dueled members of the Jedi Council. Dooku and Grievous were only on the most prominent battlefields, and Maul, Ventress, and Savage Opress remained mostly confined to the criminal underworld. While Ventress was sent on more missions than most, she was still only one individual in comparison to the tens of thousands of Jedi Knights. Therefore, most survivors of Order 66 had never even encountered a formal lightsaber duel before, let alone with the likes of Lord Vader. Altogether, these primary traits culminated in one of the most imposing, if not the single most imposing and formidable Jedi Executioner in the history of the Star Wars galaxy, a figure who was single-handedly responsible for the deaths of dozens of Jedi, all different skill levels, they all fell to Lord Vader. But Greetings friends, and welcome back to today's video. Darth Vader was the most crucial being in the entire galaxy, with his influence stretching across not only the far reaches of space, but also the reaches of time itself. All throughout Star Wars history, both before and after Vader's coming, the entire galaxy would be shaped and molded by this single man. Not just him, but also the entire Skywalker lineage and family. One might even go as far to say that the Skywalker bloodline had a form of anointing by the Force which caused it to echo through the ripples of time and space itself. We know that the Sith of old had terrifying visions of Darth Vader, from Darth Bane to Darth Plagueis. However, the visions stretch even further than this, dating as far back as the time of Revan and the Old Republic. So, today, curious acolytes of the galaxy, we thought we would explore the very first time that Darth Vader was perceived through the Force, and perhaps an interesting theory along with it, as well as the idea of why ancient Sith Lords did not like how Darth Vader ultimately turned out, and why some of them hated him. Our story begins in the Old Republic in the years following the finale of the Great Sith Wars. The Mandalorian War was just beginning, as they had begun attacking the Outer Rim territories and the Jedi were remaining neutral in the conflict. However, one group of Jedi Masters, called the First Watch Circle, advocated for the Jedi to go to war against the Mandalorians, and went to prepare in the system of Taurus with their Jedi Padawans. However, as the Masters were communing on a moon, they all had a traumatizing shared vision. All of them and many Jedi lied dead on Coruscant. The temple was in flames, and any Jedi that were retreating were being gunned down. Standing among the dead, though, was a masked man wearing the red and fire suit that many of their Padawans trained in. The Masters soon went mad after the vision, and called their Padawans together for a knighting ceremony, where they then slaughtered all of these Padawans in an attempt to thwart this prophecy of a Padawan gone rogue and the destruction of the Jedi Order. Sometime later, the group was attempting to locate the Myrrh Talisman, an ancient Sith talisman created by Karnas Myrrh that could create a terrible plague, and hopefully use it to reverse the Rakul Plague that had started to spread in the underbelly of Taurus. Whenever Karnas Myrrh's talisman had been recovered, during their hunt, one of the masters, named Quanila, who was adept at seeing through the Force, had another terrifying vision. She saw the Sith Lord Karnas Myrrh leading a massive army of Rakul on a planet, with the Jedi futilely fighting back against them. Among the fire and ruin, they saw three figures, figures that they did not know, but we do. There was Darth Vader, Luke Skywalker, and Cade Skywalker. She was shaken out of her vision by a fellow Jedi. Trying to make sense of it, she attempted to say what she had just seen, but the other Jedi, who were mourning a fallen comrade, seemed to wave her off and the only part of her vision they cared about was the Myrrh Talisman. So, what did this Jedi think of Lord Vader? 
well, she doesn't really get a chance to share her thoughts, but we can tell by her hysterical reaction that she was quite obviously filled with immense fear. Here was a man more intimidating than anything she had ever seen. Even the vision of the other masked man that led her to slay her own Padawan was not this bad. She knew nothing of Vader except for the fact that she knew he would be the one to completely destroy the Jedi Order. It had not entirely been explained as to why she had foreseen Cade and Luke alongside Vader, but the connection between the three is obviously their bloodline, but also the fact that they each will have come into contact with the Myrrh Talisman at some point in the future. Vader, when he searches for it right after the events of Revenge of the Sith, and finds it in the stasis casket of Celeste Moore. Celeste would carry the talisman with her, and would both meet Luke and his descendant Cade 150 years later. But we have a theory as to why this is. Perhaps it is possible they only knew who are touched with the dark side on a deep level, and those that can perceive Vader. These Jedi truly fell to the dark side after they had slaughtered their Padawans, and Darth Bane and Plagueis need no explanation why they were able to see Darth Vader. It is only at this moment where this ancient Jedi was so in tune with the dark side that she could see the vision that would become Lord Vader one day. But this doesn't answer the question as to why the ancient Sith hated Darth Vader. To this, we can point to the Darth Vader comic book series when Vader himself comes into contact with Lord Mammon, an ancient Sith Lord. Lord Mammon has a pretty good case as to why the ancient Sith hate Vader as well as Sidious, stating that they have an obsession with the Jedi Order, when to the ancient Sith, the Jedi were ants to be stomped upon. He states that not only this, but that it is their obsession with the Jedi Order that will lead to their ultimate downfall. He is sickened by the fact that Darth Vader himself was a former Jedi. But not only this, Lord Mammon states that not only have they become more like the Jedi, but they have also abandoned the true ideology and method of the dark side itself. Mammon states that it is not an empire that the Sith ultimately envisioned, but a Sith empire, and that Vader and Sidious are merely pretenders, with them being insulted that they would keep secret that even Vader and Sidious themselves were Sith. The Sith wanted to rule and rule proudly, and this is not what Lord Mammon said Vader and Sidious were doing. He said that that the Sith were meant to follow the dark side of the Force, and that it was the flow of the dark side that the Sith were envisioned to follow, to destroy and conquer, not to cultivate, rule, and build, which is something else that Lord Mammon accused Darth Vader of doing. In truth, many ancient Sith Lords would have hated Vader and Sidious. However, these ancient Sith Lords would never rule. These ancient Sith Lords that were loyal to the rule of two, and who in their own right would have hated Darth Bane. Darth Bane changed the formulation of the Sith and believed that the Sith should only be two in number, a master to have the power and an apprentice to desire the power. He stated that the dark side of the Force would be completely subservient to them and not the other way around. But here is a moment where Lord Mummon and the ancient Sith Lords strike true with Lord Vader, strike more true and to his very core than nearly anybody else before them. He states that as Anakin Skywalker, he believed in the Jedi prophecy that he was the chosen one, and then he insults Vader further, stating that he still believes it to this day. With this being the defining fact that the Jedi and the Sith were now so intertwined that even the greatest of the Sith was still a servant to Jedi prophecy. But here's the thing about this confrontation. Lord Mammon and the ancient Sith are wrong. It was the direct downfall of the ancient Sith because of the fact they did not give the Jedi the respect and fear that they should have commanded. An individual like Palpatine knew that the Jedi were powerful. In fact, he knew they were so powerful and this is why he hated them. He hated that they did not use their power in the way that he believes they should have to conquer. The ancient Sith Lords discarded them altogether, which was again their defining mistake. The greatest mistake that the ancient Sith made was not taking advantage of the Jedi. Some of the greatest Sith in the modern era stem from Darth Vader and Dooku, two powerful former Jedi, something that instead of casting aside, Darth Sidious exploited openly. But anyway my friends, there is your answer, and that is why the ancient Sith Lords disliked and outright hated Darth Vader and his master, as well as the earliest vision of Darth Vader in Star Wars Legends. But what are your thoughts on this? Were the Sith of old foolish? Were they foolish to believe that the Jedi were weak and could pose no threat to them at all? And was the rule of two far more advanced in actuality? And were Vader and Sidious more enlightened than these ancient Sith Lords? I would love to hear all of your thoughts and comments on this down below. And as always, my friends, may the Force be with you, and have a great day.
Darth Vader is perhaps one of the most tragic characters in the modern Star Wars franchise, after having lost quite literally everything and everyone that he had ever loved, and helping the rise of the Empire conquer the Old Republic that stood before it. Vader has had an immeasurable mental burden to carry with him throughout his two decades as the Sith Lord. Recently, a team of psychiatrists from UCLA and the Toolhouse University Hospital in France have teamed up to diagnose Darth Vader's mental state, and their findings were recently published. Therefore, we decided that this would be something that would be really interesting to cover here on the channel, especially in light of Obi-Wan Kenobi and Darth Vader's return. So, students of the Force, let's evaluate these findings and finally dissect Darth Vader's mental state according to the findings of seasoned professionals and qualified individuals. Dr. Eric Bowie from Toolhouse has gone on record and stated that he associates Anakin with borderline personality disorder, a condition that is caused by a break in emotional control, affecting how an individual views themselves as well as others. Some symptoms that Anakin actually displays and signs that include an increase in impulsivity, intense mood swings, and an affinity for viewing situations in stark binaries, either being all good or all bad with no gray area in between. On the surface, this seems to embody Anakin rather well, as his rash impulsivity and illusions of invincibility can be seen throughout the course of the Clone Wars and even the earlier prequel films, and his issues with anger and emotional management seem to support this theory as well. In psychiatry, there is a list of criteria that a patient must hit before a diagnosis is viable, and in the case of borderline personality disorder, there are nine possible criteria, five of which must be hit by a patient in order to qualify. The nine criteria are as follows, chronic feelings of emptiness, emotional instability in regards to day-to-day -day events, imagined abandonment, or efforts to avoid feeling real unstable self-image, impulsive behavior that has the potential to cause harm, inappropriate anger or difficulty controlling anger, pattern of unstable emotional relationships between loved ones, suicidal or self-harming tendencies, and finally, severe disassociation symptoms. According to Professor Bowie and his team, five of these factors must be met, and Anakin Skywalker, of his turn, meets six of them. His rapid shift in how he views his mentor, Obi-Wan Kenobi, can be classified as an unhealthy relationship, as Obi-Wan seems to cycle rapidly between idealizing Obi-Wan as a wise and powerful master, and then shifting into devaluing him as a mentor. Bowie and his team also cite severe abandonment issues for Anakin, not only in regards to his mother, but in terms of his relationship with Padme. His fear of losing her, an intense desire to hold on to her as tightly as possible, is a sign of dependency that stems from his previous abandonment issues, and is incredibly unhealthy. It has also been established that Anakin has made multiple attempts to distance himself from emotionally strenuous or traumatic events, and Anakin largely does this by voicing his paranoia. This is how he justified the slaughter of the Tusken Raiders as well as the murder of the younglings, automatically defaulting to his delusions and using his fears to separate himself from the weight of his actions. If these were done in the interest of protecting those that he loved, then he can use that reasoning to set aside the toll that these actions took on his psyche. His impulsive behaviors have led him to incredibly dangerous situations on multiple occasions with little regard for his own safety or the safety of those around him. And within the environment of the war, these stakes were drastically heightened. He has no qualms about making bold moves towards endangering himself, his friends, as well as the clones under his command. But perhaps the most prominent trait is his vast array of problems with his own self-identity. The weight of the Chosen One prophecy, as well as the absence of a unique father figure led him to question himself and his place in the galaxy at large. We even see this once Anakin takes on the moniker of Darth Vader, as he views Vader and Anakin as two entirely separate individuals. This is most likely another tactic to cope with his own actions, and is another method for separating himself from his past. If he attributes certain actions to Anakin Skywalker and others to Darth Vader, then he is able to absolve himself of any guilt that he might have felt, at least in his own mind. Although how effective this is, is of course debatable. Debatable. Professor Bowie even compares the use of the dark side to the use of a potent drug, in that an individual might logically know that it's wrong, yet they come to rely on this high, or rather, the senses of power associated with both aspects. Drug use, and especially that of severely dangerous drugs, comes primarily from a desire to escape the world, and individuals who are trapped in situations that they can no longer mentally cope with are far more likely to use hard drugs. This can be attributed to a feeling of power and the ability to 
willingly pull themselves out of danger or harmful situations by using the dark side, which closely resembles the dark side of the Force in its own nature and its ultimate goals. Bowie even theorizes that the psychology behind using both might be incredibly similar to one another, at least in the case for Anakin. There are two interesting notes to cover, however, the first of which is that borderline personality disorder can only be diagnosed in adults, and Anakin is just entering adulthood throughout the prequel era. In fact, the Clone Wars start when he is just 19 years of age, meaning that he is only just now able to be diagnosed professionally by the standards here on Earth. The other factor to take into account is that many of these conditions can manifest themselves in situational circumstances and not simply all at once, and a patient must show the prolonged display of these factors in day-to-day -day life in order to be professionally diagnosed. Anakin, however, was in the midst of fighting a war during this diagnosis, which is an incredibly strenuous emotional and psychological experience which might have contributed to some of these factors. And without the war, Anakin may not have actually displayed any of these. However, taking into account the multiple signs of severe depression and PTSD that Darth Vader showcases throughout the latter half of his life, it becomes abundantly clear that Darth Vader is very mentally unstable, as if this is something we didn't already know. But, thanks to the minds of Dr. Bowie and his associates, we have a more firm grasp on exactly what is going on in the psyche of Anakin and Vader, or at least a little bit better. I also want to make it clear though that here at the channel, none of us are medical professionals or psychiatrists in any way. However, these studies were done by medical professionals, and I wanted to highlight and share these studies with you guys and then get your insight into it. So, students of the Force, what do you think of this assessment? Would you like to see more research conducted on the psychological diagnosis of Star Wars characters, and if so, who else would you like to see explored? As always, my friends, thank you guys so much for watching the channel and continuing to support it. May the Force be with you, and I hope that you have a great day. The Great Jedi Purge was a period of perpetual darkness for the Jedi Order, beginning with the execution of Order 66 and continuing with the Emperor's personal war on Knights of the Jedi practice. This war carried on until the Emperor no longer believed the Jedi to be a threat, which would not occur until around the time that the first Death Star was completed. Just before the Battle of Yavin, the Jedi Purge marks the execution of 10,000 loyal Jedi Knights from across the Republic and the birth of an Empire. However, a common misconception is that Order 66 and the Jedi Purge are one and the same. However, Order 66 was the first stage of the Great Jedi Purge, and the Jedi Purge was an event that carried on for the next 20 years. Therefore, it did mark an ending. So, who was the last Jedi to be killed during this Great Jedi Purge? Which Knight of the Order survived the longest and before Obi-Wan Kenobi? Who was the last remaining Jedi Knight that Darth Vader personally executed? Today, students of the galaxy, We'll talk about the story and explore the last moments of Jedi Master Anya Kuro, one of my personal favorite Jedi Masters, and the last Jedi of the Great Jedi Purge. A brief disclaimer though is parts of this story only exist within Legends continuity, and although we cannot confirm it as of now, there is a strong possibility that much of this story also exists in modern Star Wars canon. But we will be sure to differentiate which parts are confined only to the extended universe and non-canon lore. Now, let us begin with the tale of Jedi Master Anya Kuro. Anya Kuro was a particularly unorthodox yet highly devoted Jedi initiate who developed the tendency to integrate darker practices into her Jedi teachings, channeling her old latent aggression and malicious thoughts into her training similar to that of Mace Windu. Contrary to popular belief, Mace Windu was not the only Jedi to utilize a purple lightsaber during the Modern Republic era, as Anya Kuro also developed a purple kyber crystal due to her more aggressive tendencies and harsher practices. Anya Kuro danced close to the dark side, yet never fully embracing it, standing just like Mace Windu, staunchly against it as a servant of the light side. In Legends continuity, Mace Windu's kyber crystal was gifted to him by the inhabitants of Hurricane, the planet Hurricane, which explains the distinct amethyst coloration. In canon continuity, however, we know that a Jedi develops a personal connection to their crystal that determines its coloration, and more open-minded or non-traditional Jedi had a tendency to develop unique saber colors. This is specifically prevalent in Luke Skywalker's New Jedi Academy, where his students were taught to be much more open-minded, and thus his students had an incredibly diverse range of different blade colors. Since we do not know if Anya Kuro developed a purple lightsaber in this same way in canon, this detail might only exist in Legends continuity. However, the similarities between Mace Windu and Anya Kuro cannot be ignored. 
This tendency to deviate from standard Jedi practices also allowed Anya to develop several different Force abilities that were not common for most of the Jedi Order, including the ability to influence and manipulate various forms of plant life and vegetation from across various systems across the galaxy, all things that would aid in her survival post Order 66. Anya also learned how to manipulate the light around her, light itself bending it in sort of a pseudo-invisibility cloak, rendering her invisible and allowing her an advantage as future Jedi spies. But more on that in just a moment and how this contributed to Order 66 and the Jedi Purge. In her early years as a Jedi, Anya spent her days as a knight traversing the galaxy in search of Force-sensitive children that might have been missed by the traditional Jedi screening practices, as this was her role as a Jedi Seeker. Anya would even discover a young boy on the world of Soraya who would later become a prominent member of the Jedi High Council. And although she was powerful, Anya Kuro wasn't without her weaknesses. One of her earliest challenges as a Jedi Knight was negotiating the relocation of a young Jedi, Kiadi Mundi. By convincing the people of Kiadi Mundi to let her take him back to Coruscant to be trained as a Jedi Master. While speaking with Kiadi's father, a gang of raiders arrived to steal the family's harvest, putting Mundi in particular danger due to his status as a male. On Kiadi Mundi's homeworld, the birth rate of females to males was 20 to 1, meaning that their species was severely crippled by an inability to procreate, and this meant that the bandits had a tendency to abduct young males, as males were vital to the continuation of the species. After the attack, Kiadi Mundi's father agreed to send him away to join the ranks of the Jedi Knights for his own safety, leading to one of the earliest successes that Anya Kuro had under her time as a Jedi Knight. It was also during this era that Anya Kuro would become renowned for her skills in lightsaber combat and her abilities to use the Force in very unorthodox ways. And because of her harsh nature, over the years, she was developed into the Knight whom the Jedi Masters would send their problematic trainees. Initiates who were particularly aggressive or defiant would be assigned to Anya Kuro in order to channel their more resilient nature. And over the years, Anya trained some of the most aggressive Jedi Knights of her generation. Some masters believed her practices and training methods to be particularly cruel and sometimes outright brutal and wrong. But many of the Padawans Anya Kuro trained grew into successful Jedi Knights, though not all of them were successful unfortunately. One of her most notable failures during her time as a Knight included taking on the Padawan by the name of Aura Singh, who was believed to be a problematic case by the rest of the Jedi Order. This led Aura and many of her Padawans to inherit this darkness to such a degree that by the age of 9, Aura Singh still had not been promoted to the rank of Padawan. This was due to her defiance and inability to listen to her masters. After being abducted by space pirates, Aura Singh was convinced that her master had sold her and grew into a particularly bitter nature towards this single Jedi master ultimately developing into a prolific bounty hunter with a distaste of Jedi specifically. It was following this event that Anya Kuro realized how harsh she had been to so many Jedi Padawans and believed that she and herself had partially embraced the dark side. Fearing the dark side itself, she exiled herself to a faraway planet full of vegetation where she pondered on the force for many years. This is when the Clone Wars broke out. During the Clone Wars, Anya Kuro elected to assist the Republic as a spy rather than a Jedi general, and embarked on numerous quests to verify rumors and collect intelligence on the Confederacy of Independent Systems in favor for the Jedi and the Republic. She continued to serve the Order during the Calamity of the Clone Wars, using her newfound alignment to realize that spying on her enemies and gathering information was just as useful as being a fully formed general. This is why no clone troopers were around on Yakuro when Order 66 was executed, and she was able to go back to the planet Kofgren 5 where she had spent most of her time in exile pondering on the light side and the Jedi, and had mastered the planet so intricately that no stormtrooper or member of the newly found empire, be that inquisitors or even Lord Vader himself, was able to locate her for nearly 20 years. Anya Kuro had previously spent 12 years in this part of the galaxy during her hiatus and her exile. She was intimately familiar with this particular system, which allowed her to adapt much more easily to a brand new environment, as well as use the ability to influence light itself to keep her presence hidden in the Force. Here, Anya Kuro lived as a hermit for the duration of the Galactic Empire's reign, existing in isolation for the greater part of two decades, until unfortunately, the Emperor's Hand, Mara Jade, which is Star Wars Legends, was able to track her down. 
However, even Mara Jade, being an incredibly prolific duelist and lightsaber wielder, refused to engage Anya Kura, as he knew that Anya Kura was a prize that Darth Vader wanted for some time being one of the most powerful Jedi Masters that were unaccounted for following Order 66. Therefore, upon hearing of her confirmed survival, Vader ventured to the system immediately. When he arrived, the two shared a philosophical conversation as Anya Kuro was done hiding from the Dark Lord. They talked about the nature of evolution and extinction, and although Anya Kuro had largely resigned herself to death, she still elected to put up a fight against the Dark Lord. The two of them engaged in a very heated lightsaber duel, with Anya Kuro putting up an incredible last stand against the Dark Lord, as although she knew she would die regardless, she wanted to make Darth Vader and Anakin try. This is also another important note. It is highly implied that Anya Kuro sensed that Darth Vader and Anakin were one and the same. She truly made Darth Vader push his limits in the Force, and nearly killed him outright. However, Vader was simply too strong. After pinning Kuro beneath a tree, Vader executed the last Jedi that he would kill before his duel with Obi-Wan, with Darth Sidious himself later proclaiming that with the death of Anya Kuro, this marked the end of the Great Jedi Purge, and the last of the Jedi to be killed, deeming all the Jedi that remained insignificant fools of a bygone era. And therefore, within records, Anya Kuro marks the official end of the Jedi Purge. But then, hey, what's up guys and welcome back to the channel. Today, an interesting question was posed. If Bacta is so powerful and is basically so OP in the Star Wars universe, as we've seen it heal multiple characters from Din Djarin to Obi-Wan Kenobi to Luke Skywalker, why does the Bacta not seem to heal Darth Vader at all? And yet, why does he still continue to use it? And today, we will answer that question. Bacta tanks have been used as some of the premier medical treatments that the galaxy has to offer offer in Star Wars, able to heal a wide variety of different injuries and ailments while rejuvenating an injured victim's physical state until they were fully recovered. Over the years, we've seen everyone from Luke Skywalker, Boba Fett, and more use a Bacta tank to help treat their wounds and nurse them back to full health, especially after encountering any number of battle-related injuries, in Boba's case, being encased within the Sarlacc and eaten by it. While the Bacta tank has been shown to be highly effective in the medical field, it leaves us to wonder why one of the most severely burned and most drastically injured individuals in the galaxy does not use one to help him heal himself entirely. Why hasn't Darth Vader used a Bacta tank to heal his charred flesh and returned him to his former glory despite having access to the resources necessary to do so? It is stated, quote, that Darth Vader did have a Bacta tank that was located in his castle. However, it was unable to heal him, while the Dark Lord would relax and meditate using it outside of his life support system. As the the Bacta tank offered him a modicum of comfort. It is also stated that the primary function of Darth Vader's Bacta tank was for him to maintain organ function, but again, it did not heal him. So why is this? Something else interesting about Darth Vader's Bacta tank, it is noted that Palpatine actually placed Darth Vader in Bacta after his duel on Mustafar with Obi-Wan Kenobi, while they were preparing the Sith Lord's armor, with Anakin stating that the Bacta didn't truly do enough to spare him from his pain. However, it has also been stated that the Bacta tank is sometimes ineffective in regards to Vader specifically, and Vader oftentimes actively chooses not to use it for personal reasons, despite them being relatively common place in the Star Wars mythos, there are some misconceptions about what a Bacta tank actually does and how it operates. Bacta tanks utilize a fluid called Bacta to heal major injuries, but despite what many have been led to believe, it doesn't actually heal an injured person by repairing their body, and Bacta outright doesn't do anything to fix a person. Instead, what Bacta tanks do is allow the body to quicken its own natural healing processes. This means that it can only help the body heal itself in the same way that it would heal itself naturally naturally, and it doesn't contribute anything externally towards healing somebody in the healing process. Bacta just allows their body to heal itself much more quickly than would otherwise take place on its own. Due to this, if someone sustains an injury that would regularly take days or weeks to fully heal, they would be able to naturally heal much more quickly by soaking in a Bacta tank. Luke Skywalker, for example, needed the time to recover from hypothermia and his Wampa-related injuries on Hoth, but instead of waiting for weeks to fully heal, he was able to grow back to his full strength by using Bacta. Therefore, for organic flesh that would eventually heal itself regardless, a Bacta tank is just an accelerated healing process and healing 
healing aid that is very effective. It doesn't actually do anything to heal the body on its own. It can treat minor burns and injuries like in the case of Boba Fett and in Luke's case, instances of hypothermia and everyday bumps and bruises. Darth Vader, however, is another case entirely. Let's break down the specific reasoning. The main reason is, is that Vader's scar tissue is no longer alive. After his duel on Mustafar against Obi-Wan, Vader's body became mostly inorganic scar tissue that died upon being burnt, and very little of his skin is still actually alive. Instead, he effectively has natural plating on his skin that doesn't have any healing properties of its own, because of course now it's mostly scar tissue. Since this scar tissue has no natural healing properties, the Bacta tank can't heal this dead flesh simply because it would never have been able to heal itself in the first place. Because the Bacta tank does nothing to help, there is no way for a Bacta tank to be effective except for any few parts of Vader's body that could actually have been healed, and he did in fact use a Bacta tank to heal what little could be helped shortly following his duel. It just so happens that this is the fullest extent of what the Bacta tank was able to do for Lord Vader. This is why Bacta can't re grow limbs or heal severed appendages, which is simply because humans do not already have an innate ability to do this. But in addition to a Bacta tank's inability to heal Vader beyond certain points, there are also various personal reasons why Vader doesn't like to use a Bacta tank all that often, though sometimes for Vader, the pain simply grows too much. Primarily, Vader refuses medical treatment in order to actively make himself more uncomfortable on a daily basis, on purpose. He does this in order to likewise strengthen his connection with the dark side, which is fueled by his pain, anger, and vengeance, as well as the severe discomfort that Vader lives with daily, as this is incredibly adept at channeling dark side energies. If Vader were comfortable, then he might run the risk of seeing his power wane, and he would not be as formidable as the force of nature as he has grown into over the course of his life as a Sith. This is the same reason why he refuses various upgrades to his suit despite being offered various augmentations. And even though the Emperor and the Empire have the ability to craft him a much stronger suit, he wants the discomfort in order to be stronger due to his pain, and he simply cannot risk any weaknesses in battle. There is also prevalent time component that comes with rejuvenating in a Bacta tank, as it takes a considerable amount of time before it is effective. We know that Boba Fett had to use one for weeks on end as it restored him to his former self and if Vader was forced to sit for this prolonged period of time, then he would be left alone with his thoughts for hours on end. In the times when Darth Vader uses the Bacta tank, he was exposed to the chamber for several hours at any given time, and he even had some degree of comfort when doing so. During this time, however, he would meditate in the Force and help to clear his mind, but given his severe trauma and fractured mental state, being alone with his thoughts for prolonged periods of time was inherently dangerous for Vader's own personal well-being. His thoughts destroyed him. While he would meditate successfully for a duration of time, he often found his thoughts drifting back to Padme, his love for her, and the Jedi Order that he had betrayed. This immense loneliness would set in, and cause Vader to hate himself with a ferocious passion, which he sought to avoid at all costs. In truth, Vader found meditating in Bacta to be highly mentally as well as emotionally taxing. Vader was notoriously stingy with his free time, as he did not like to relax simply because it allowed his mind to wander, which he hated. It is because of this, Vader most often used the Bacta tank to meditate, as even when he was offered relief from his own physical wounds and his physical pain, the mental pain was ever prevalent and even more severe than was normal. But to answer the question, Darth Vader, while he used the Bacta tank sparingly, did not actually like it all that much, as well as the fact that Darth Vader's body was unable to heal his severe wounds. Again, Bacta does not grow back limbs or appendages, and Darth Vader's skin is essentially dead. It is known that medical droids would actually have to scrape away Darth Vader's dead skin time and time again in order for him to not get infected. An extremely painful process. But again, this is the reason why Bacta was extremely ineffective against the Dark Lord. But anyway, my friends, what are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on why Bacta could not heal Darth Vader? And Greetings, friends in the Force and acolytes of the galaxy, and welcome back to the channel. Recently, we have been talking quite a bit about Vader's exploits following Order 66, as well as the many functions and restrictions bred within his suit. We have known for a while all of the numerous physical and emotional tolls that the suit had on Vader, especially during the first couple of weeks he had within his suit. He had slipped into a deep depression, to the point where Palpatine had to talk him out of it. Well, today, we will be going into Vader's very mind and becoming him as we personally experience what it was like truly for Anakin when he had first 
risen from his operating table. Today's sources come from the Revenge of the Sith novelization, where we truly get the first person view inside the suit of Anakin Skywalker. First though, I want to briefly explore Anakin's thoughts while he was being burned on Mustafar. The main thing that Anakin was thinking whilst being burned is holding to his hatred for Obi-Wan Kenobi, but also the curiosity of Padme's death, or at the time not knowing about her death. Was she okay? These were the questions that rattled within Vader's mind as he burned. His hatred for himself, Anakin Skywalker, and Obi-Wan keeping him alive. But it's when Vader emerges from the operating table that his thoughts become truly interesting. This is the following quote. This is how it feels to be Anakin Skywalker. The first dawn of the light in your universe brings pain. The light burns you. It will always burn you. Part of you will always lie upon black glass, sand besides a lake of fire, while flames chew upon your flesh. You can hear yourself breathing. It comes hard and harsh, and it scrapes nerves already raw, but you cannot stop it. You can never stop it. You cannot even slow it down. You don't even have lungs anymore. Mechanisms, hardwired into your chest, breathe for you. They will pump oxygen into your bloodstream forever. Pausing this passage a moment, we now understand that taking a breath and the sound that comes from Vader's suit isn't his own breathing, but the sound of machines pumping air into Vader's body. He couldn't even breathe on his own. This is something we were aware of, but perhaps not to this extent. In the video we did a few days ago, we talked about many of the most interesting functions of Vader's suit, and how his chest plate had a manual override for his respiratory system. Only with this manual override could he breathe by himself, and forced himself to exert himself a little more. However, he couldn't keep this active for too long, as his lungs were far too weak to even breathe on his own. All hours of the day, Vader's suit automatically pumped oxygen in and out of his lungs for him. It is hardly possible to imagine how uncomfortable that would be. Anyway, let's continue, and more on how his gifts on the Force have been diminished. Lord Vader. Lord Vader, can you hear me? And you can't. Not in the way that you once did. Sensors in the shell that prisons your head trickle meaning directly into your brain. You open your scorched pale eyes. Optical sensors integrate light and shadow into a hideous simulacrum of the world around you. Or perhaps the simulacrum is perfect and it is the world that is hideous. Padme, are you here? Are you alright? You try to say, but another voice speaks for you, out from the vocabulator that serves you from your burned away lips and tongue and throat. Pausing again, Vader did not recognize his own voice as it came out. Inside his helmet, his voice came out only as a wheeze and a faint whisper, but then the vocabulator boomed out something entirely different. We also get a view of what the inside of Vader's eye lenses looked like. The red filters of the lens had to shape his view in a way that his barely functioning eyes could see. Again likely with the pain unbearable, he hadn't yet been able to open his eyes. And not to mention that he had not had enough time in the back to tank, so all of his wounds were extremely fresh. The simple act of trying to open and blink his eyes must have been excruciating, but not nearly as painful as the emotional toll of what Anakin was about to discover. Let us continue with the passage. Padme, are you here? Are you alright? I'm very sorry, Lord Vader. I'm afraid that she died. It seems in your anger that you killed her. This burns hotter than the lava had. No, no, it's not possible. You loved her. You will always love her. But you remember, you remember all of it. You remember the dragon that you brought Vader forth from the heart to slay. You remember the cold venom in Vader's blood. You remember the furnace of Vader's fury, and the black hatred of seizing her throat to silence her lying mouth. And there is one blazing moment in which you finally understand that there was no dragon. There was no Vader. There was only you. Only Anakin Skywalker. That it was all you. You killed her because finally, when you could have saved her, when you could have gone away with her, when you could have been thinking of her, you were thinking about yourself. It is in this blazing moment that you finally understand the trap of the dark side, the final cruelty of the Sith, because now yourself is all that you will ever have. And you rage and scream and reach through the force to crush the shadow who has destroyed you, but you are so far less now than what you were. You are more than half machine. You are like a painter gone blind, a composer gone deaf. You can remember where the power was, but the power you can touch is only a memory. And so, with all of your world destroying fury, it is only droids around you that implode, and equipment, and the table on which you were strapped shatters. And in the end, you cannot touch the shadow. In the end, 
you do not even want to. In the end, the shadow is all that you have left, because the shadow understands you, the shadow forgives you, the shadow gathers you unto itself, and within your furnace heart, you burn in your own flame. This is how it feels to be Anakin Skywalker forever. This is quite a bit, but let's go ahead and unpack it all. In this moment, Anakin is trying to reason out the dichotomy between himself and who Vader is. He is trying to think that perhaps if he could pin the blame on all of the atrocities on Vader, then he can escape the blame, but he realizes that Vader has always been there within him, and that Lord Vader has always been a part of Anakin. This passage describes his initial anguish in great detail, and then we get to see what it feels like as he tries to lash out and attack and kill what the passage refers to as the Shadow which of course was Sidious. Vader was in a strange way, both incredibly powerful in his rage and far weaker than he had been. He could only destroy the droids around him, but he couldn't touch Sidious, not yet at least. The way the passage describes Vader's feelings towards his lack of ability to fully touch the force that he once had helps us understand what it truly meant to have only reached 80% of Sidious's power and far less of what Anakin could have achieved. What's more than this though is Vader's feelings towards Sidious Sidious himself. He is both enraged but in conflict as he realizes that Sidious is all that Vader has left in this life. In the comics, Vader's reaction is different. Vader immediately lashes out at Sidious and force chokes him, slamming him into a wall while convicting him of not keeping his promise to save Padme. What we truly find interesting about this passage though is Vader's view on the dark side as a whole. He acknowledged the trap of the dark side and the final cruelty of the Sith, that being that those that follow the dark side and following down the dark path will leave you more alone than you had ever been before. Darth Vader understands where he stands with both Sidious and the dark side itself. He has become the victim of their whims and abuse after taking advantage of the powers it granted him during Order 66. Now though, Vader is paying the price. The dark side is a drug much like steroids, or what is more acute to the dark side is like taking out a loan. The interest builds very quickly, and soon, it will take far more than it ever gave. It grants instant power gratification, but the will of the force is that it will always balance itself out, and the dark side is destined to destroy you. This is what Vader is truly realizing in this moment. He continued to use the dark side as he felt as though he had nothing to lose, so he willingly gave into the trap and sunk further into the darkness. The pain that he felt inside and out was far too unbearable to at least not get something out of it. But in the end, Vader was left with nothing, and this is the final moment of Anakin Skywalker. This is when Vader takes over completely, and it won't be until Return of the Jedi that Anakin returns once more. So, students of the Force, what did you think of today's reading? What are your thoughts on the final moments of Anakin Skywalker, his description of the dark side, Sidious, his suit, and more? And the release of the Obi-Wan Kenobi series has seen one of the most prolific Jedi back in action after nearly two decades of being absent from live action. Early in the series, we learned that Obi-Wan buried both his lightsaber as well as Anakin Anakin's deep within the Dune Sea, abandoning them and leaving them to be lost in order to hide his identity as a former Jedi Knight. During the series, however, Obi-Wan ignites his iconic weapon once again as he faces down Darth Vader and his forces, leading into the events directly of A New Hope and his eventual demise at the hands of Lord Vader aboard the first Death Star. While the saber was presumed to be lost after Master Kenobi's death before the destruction of the first Death Star, is there an actual explanation for what happened to the blade after it was presumed to be gone or destroyed? What happened to Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber after he was presumably joined with the Force and defeated by Lord Vader? Well, students of the Force, we may have an answer of exactly what happened to Obi-Wan's lightsaber. As of now, this explanation comes from Legends continuity, however, we will be combining pieces of canon. We would also like to add that this fits into current canon rather nicely without breaking continuity until after the events of Return of the Jedi. This means that there aren't any major plot holes created by using this explanation as of now, and it's highly likely that this will be adopted for canon very soon. Therefore, despite this being the definitive explanation in Legends, we will be treating this as a very likely possibility for modern canon. In Legends, Darth Vader recovered the blade of Obi-Wan Kenobi after finally defeating his former master, and he kept it for himself as a rare prize. Darth Vader ensured its safety upon the destruction of the first Death Star, 
though he himself wouldn't use Obi-Wan's lightsaber. Darth Vader ultimately had it sent away to his fortress on Mustafar, where it would hang as one of his most prolific trophies. If the saber survived the destruction of the Death Star in canon, then it is most likely where it ended up, in Vader's Mustafarian chambers. Here, it stayed on display as one of his most prized possessions for several years, showcasing his ultimate departure from his past life and representing the failures of Anakin Skywalker, as well as the triumphs of Darth Vader. This is important to Darth Vader, as Darth Vader actually built his fortress where he could overlook his ultimate defeat at the hands of Obi-Wan Kenobi. Darth Vader could actively look out his window and see where he was cut down by his former master. And now, with his former master's lightsaber within his own chambers, the circle was complete and the learner was now the master. From here, we will be covering the depiction of events from Legends material, and then based off of this, we can speculate as to where the saber might be in canon. In its ultimate fate in Star Wars canon, as now, it is believed that Vader did in fact take it. This is significant as Vader rarely took trophies from Jedi unlike the Inquisitors. Obi-Wan of course though, was an exception. In Legends continuity, this is where the saber would reside throughout the remainder of the original trilogy, until Luke would eventually be able to reconstruct the new Jedi Order, and eventually train Jedi Padawans of his own. At one point, two of Luke's students by the names of Tione Solisar and Ikrit were sent to the Basque Castle in search of ancient relics, as well as artifacts that had foregone time, and they entered Vader's castle long after it had been seemingly abandoned. Here, they would come across a false darksider by the name of Orlok, who had come across the legendary lightsaber of Obi-Wan Kenobi and used the lightsaber to then threaten the two Jedi Padawans. After an ensuing battle, he eventually fell victim to the traps of the castle, which led him to narrowly escaping certain death. Though he was able to ultimately escape death, he left the lightsaber of Obi-Wan behind for Luke's students to collect and present to Luke directly for authentication. While it had been returned to the relatively safe hands of Luke Skywalker, and now the apprentice had the lightsaber of his master in Obi-Wan, that didn't mean that the lightsaber was immediately out of danger, as it would later be stolen by an individual by the name of Oldir Lockett. Oldir Lockett, who sought to become a Jedi despite not being force sensitive at all. This led to him developing a fascination with the Jedi, and he wanted a lightsaber of his own despite lacking the ability to create a connection with a kyber crystal. It is from here that Orlok and his own students of the dark side joined forces with Uldor Lockett against Tione Solisar and Luke Skywalker's numerous other Jedi Padawans. Throughout the ensuing battle, the lightsaber of Obi-Wan Kenobi traded hands numerous times before eventually being recovered by Anakin Solo and eventually returned to the new Jedi Academy where it would remain once and for all, and for the remainder of its known lifespan. While this is where the story of Legends ends in regards to Obi-Wan's lightsaber, ultimately ending up in the hands of Luke Skywalker and his new Jedi Academy, what can we conclude about the canonical explanation based on what we know in the original continuity of Star Wars, and what do we know happened to Obi-Wan's lightsaber in Star Wars canon? Based on this information, it's likely that Obi-Wan's lightsaber was kept by Vader much like it was in the Legends explanation, and it's highly probable that it was likewise kept within Vader's Mustafarian castle. As of now, there is nothing to suggest that this part of the timeline is any different, and the events of Legends and canon don't conflict until long after the events of Return of the Jedi. One of the primary changes that most likely occurred is that in canon, it's possible that one of Luke's students came across Obi-Wan's lightsaber, but it's more likely that it was actually Luke himself that found the blade in Vader's castle. We know this because we know Luke Skywalker spent much of his time traversing the galaxy in search of Jedi teachings and artifacts, including numerous sites that were significant for the Jedi and even the Sith alike. We know that he was even able to come into possession of Yoda's lightsaber, and it likely came from the Jedi Temple directly, where it was last seen being lost by Darth Sidious. Therefore, it's highly likely that Mustafar was one of Luke Skywalker's destinations, as it was not only the site of Vader's legendary castle, but it was also the very same location where Vader and Kenobi dueled for the very first time. It is likely that Luke Skywalker found Obi-Wan's lightsaber because it was a trophy which was meant to be displayed likely in plain sight to some degree. After this, it's likely that Luke Skywalker even saved 
take the lightsaber from the destruction and turn of Ben Solo and Darth Sidious. And it's likely that Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber would eventually be passed down to Rey. But it's good that it eventually remained in the hands of its original apprentice in Luke and that Obi-Wan, the master, had now seemingly made penance. It's important to note though that in Legends and likely in canon continuity, Darth Vader took Obi-Wan's lightsaber as one of his greatest prizes and one of his greatest triumphs against the Jedi. With this being the story and the fate of Obi-Wan Kenobi's lightsaber. But what are your thoughts on this? What are your thoughts on the ultimate fate of Obi-Wan's lightsaber and how Darth Vader proudly displayed it within his Mustafarian castle as a prize and a trophy even though Lord Vader was not known for taking trophies? Of course he made an exception for Kenobi. As Darth Vader, the insurmountable titan of the dark side and champion of the empire. On the channel, we have covered many times the early career of Darth Vader and his ceaseless ability to turn Jedi into memories. Hardly any Jedi who have ever went against Darth Vader have ever survived, and if they did, they were forever changed by him until he hunted them down and finished what he had begun. Would there have been plenty of Jedi in canon who were able to escape the Dark Lord's clutches by sheer luck or skill alone? Very few have been able to actually contend with the Dark Lord. While yes, Vader has seen his fair share of challenges in the fight, it was not often that he met a Jedi opponent that he could not defeat. However, that happens to be today's topic. Our researchers got their hands on some classified Imperial documents that we have found a very short list of Jedi that have actually defeated and almost killed Darth Vader. So sit with us today, curious travelers of the galaxy, as we delve into these Jedi. Before we continue though, we are certain that everyone is well acquainted with Luke Skywalker and the likes of Obi-Wan Kenobi's respective victories against Darth Vader. We also have already done a video on Jedi that defeated Vader by the name of Boltar Swan, so if you'd like to see that video, I highly recommend you check out the Jedi that defeated Darth Vader and why she didn't kill him. With that assumption, we'd rather not spend time retreading familiar ground on the channel. So, beyond these three Jedi, let's discuss the other Jedi that defeated Darth Vader in combat. The first Jedi that we'd like to discuss is a rather interesting story where Vader's opponent is an ancient Jedi named Celeste Moore, who lives somewhere at the tail end of the new Sith Wars. Back in her day, she was attempting to locate and secure the Sith Talisman known as the Myrrh Talisman, a powerful Sith artifact created by none other than Karnas Myrrh, one of the original Dark Jedi that formed the first Sith Empire. After the securing of the artifact, she ended up being contained in a stasis casket known as the Obelite for the next 4,000 years. This was until Darth Vader and a research team uncovered her casket and Vader freed her from within it, ending her long slumber. Upon waking, she immediately panicked and interrogated the scientist about what year it was and the outcome of the Mandalorian Wars. The scientist then informed her that the Mandalorians did not win the war, quote, so the Republic still stands then. She says, now calming down, no, responded the scientist. The Republic was taken over and turned into the Galactic Empire, ruled by the Sith. He points at Vader, and Celeste is sent into a rage and immediately ignites her golden bladed lightsaber and immediately attacks the Sith Lord. All during this battle, Vader actually mentions that he doesn't want to hurt her and continuously offers for her to join him and rule by his side. Sensing her incredible ability to touch the Force and the ancient ideals that she possesses. However, at every turn, she is indignant against the Dark Lord and does not take his hand. During this time, the spirit of Karnas Myrrh directly, which which has possessed the amulet is constantly goading at Celeste. Since she holds the amulet, only she can see or even hear him, and he is increasingly bothering her to surrender the amulet to Lord Vader and let him kill her. He does this because he is able to sense Darth Vader's power. Karnas Myrrh wishes to possess him and become his new master. Celeste, however, refuses. Despite her putting up an admirable fight against Darth Vader, she loses the lightsaber duel and Vader once again gives her the chance to join him. Much like he did with Luke, Celeste decides that she'd rather die than see the amulet in the hands of a Sith Lord, and in a desperate last-ditch effort, she gives in and uses the power of the amulet and turns everyone in the vicinity, save for Vader himself, who was able to overcome the power, into a Rakul monster, all of which turned at Vader at a single time. 
Overwhelmed by the numbers, Vader was forced to retreat, leaving Celeste more on the planet. Celeste would actually go on to live for a very long time following, dying in 137 ABY, outliving both Vader and even Luke Skywalker. Although she didn't defeat Vader in single combat directly, she still managed to get the upper hand on the Sith Lord and lived through it to tell the tale, much unlike dozens of Jedi that had faced Vader previously. And now, we have Jedi Master Karak and Vala. This is a unique story as it is confirmed to be canon and is actually from the original Darth Vader run that follows him post Revenge of the Sith. We begin our story very shortly after the events of Revenge of the Sith. The Emperor has ordered Vader to construct his own new lightsaber, and in order to do so, Vader would first need to find a lightsaber crystal and corrupt it. At this time, this was after the great burning of all Jedi lightsabers on Coruscant, a quite public display on behalf of the Empire, so no more kyber crystals remained to be easily acquired and accessible. This was also a period of time where Vader was newly in his suit, and if you have seen our video detailing Darth Vader's entire first year in the suit and his experience with it, then you know the awkward clunkiness that he experienced within his own armor. Anyway, the story opens with Master and Fala in deep meditation, assembling some sort of object with the Force whenever he is attacked by a droid. The Jedi defends himself from the training droid while having a conversation with it, all while continuing to assemble the large metal contraption through the Force itself. He manages to defeat the droid right as he finishes constructing what he refers to as a trap. He then mentions that he feels something dark is on his horizon, and at that moment, Darth Vader's ship entered the atmosphere. It should be noted that Karak and Fala had actually taken what is known as a barrage valve, meaning he was under self-exile, and was not around the Jedi Order when the clones turned on him during Order 66. This is why he was Darth Vader's first target. Master and Fala hurls the metal contraption at the ship, heavily damaging it and causing it to crash on the planet. Vader immediately begins making his way towards finding the Jedi though, obviously surviving the crash. As soon as he does, he immediately attempts to force choke the Jedi Master. But then, Karak simply says no, and breaks Darth Vader's choke connection to him by force pushing the Sith Lord away. The Jedi then declares that Vader will not defeat him, at least not that way, and that he will have to fight him hand to hand. Already, we see that this Jedi Master is not like the rest that Vader has come against. He is powerful, bold, and entirely fearless. He not only accepts Vader's challenge, but he openly welcomes it. Setting the time and place, Master Infala tells Vader to meet him at the peak of a nearby mountain, where the Jedi had come to be tested. Now though, it was Vader's turn. After this, Vader climbs the mountain, facing a few tribulations and obstacles before meeting the Jedi Master face to face in the summit. Vader swipes the weapon that the training droid has been using, as of course he does not possess a lightsaber, as he then uses it to attack the Jedi Master. However, Karak would prove to be too much for the Dark Lord, as in the duel, Vader's leg would be destroyed and he would be force pushed straight off the side of the cliff by the Jedi Master, ultimately making Karak the victor. At the bottom of the mountain, Vader lay in near shambles. He used part of the training droid to replace his leg and went back after the Jedi Master. Believing Vader to be dead, the Jedi Master went to a nearby city located under a dam in order to acquire a starfighter, in order to fly out to find Sidious and restore order to the galaxy. However, the Jedi Master was shocked when he felt Darth Vader return to his presence. Karak met him atop the dam, and the two had another pass in combat before warning shots from the blasters went off behind them. It was the local law enforcement who ordered them off of the ledge. They ordered the two of them to stop since they were standing atop a critical facility. Vader, using the Force, threw them off of the ledge, attempting to kill them, but the Jedi Master reached out with the Force and landed them to safety. Now, the weakness of the powerful Jedi warrior was on full display to Darth Vader. Vader began to destabilize the dam with the Force. As a result, Master and Fala tried to hold it together while begging Vader to kill him and let the people live. Instead, by the Jedi Master's concentration, Vader took the Master's lightsaber and snapped the Jedi's neck. As his body fell into the water, Vader left the entire city to drown as the dam broke free and flooded it. In this situation, Master Karak and Fala proved to be too much of a challenge for the fledging Vader one-on-one. -on -one. 
early in the Sith Lord's career. I cannot emphasize that this is just after Darth Vader has been encased within his armor. However, Vader returns and exploits his weakness, although being heavily damaged. This in turn forced the Dark Lord to rely on dirty tricks involving innocents in order to gain the upper hand. Nonetheless though, it should not be understated that in their first encounter, Karak and Fala very much defeated Darth Vader. Again though, the circumstances are of course, well, circumstantial. There was one other instance though in which the Jedi have triumphed over Darth Vader, but we are careful to include it on this list as it is uncertain as to whether Vader would have suffered a total defeat or whether or not something else would have occurred. We are talking about the Jedi Conclave on Kessel. In a Legends comic, Vader was lured into a trap by having it leaked that there would be a Jedi meeting that Obi-Wan Kenobi would be directly attending following Order 66. This information though was false, as Vader was ambushed by eight Jedi, five of which he killed almost effortlessly. It was only after Darth Vader suffered a few damages that he hurled a large magnitude of rocks at the remaining three Jedi that were still attacking him relentlessly. These Jedi combined their might in the force and sent the rocks back at Vader, damaging his armor further. After this, a battalion of clones came to Vader's rescue and gunned down the remaining three Jedi. Again, it is a little foggy as to whether Vader would have been entirely out of options as the clones arrived to rescue him very shortly after the Jedi combined their strength against him. But it's also entirely possible that these three Jedi, who managed to severely injure Darth Vader, were attempting to strike him down. But we would now like to ask what you think. Do you think that this is a viable inclusion to this list? What do you think of our very few picks? As of course, it's very clear that Darth Vader was adept at killing almost every single Jedi that faced him down as the Fallen Chosen One. And the Darth Vader, the Fallen Chosen One, Hand of the Emperor, and Slayer of Jedi. As soon as this two meter tall, black clad Angel of Death arrived on scene in the Empire, he commanded fear first and respect second. With one of the highest Jedi kill counts in Star Wars history, and the highest rebel kill count count in all of the Empire, all the galaxy trembled at the mere mention of his name, Lord Vader. If from the darkness you heard his breathing, you already knew it was far too late. Seemingly the master of fear itself, was there anything that this monster was actually afraid of? Yes, actually, there were two individuals that Vader feared more than anyone else in the entire galaxy. So welcome friends to the stupendous wave, where today we'll be taking a deep character dive into Darth Vader and talking about the two people that he actually feared. The first one may or may not come as a shock to many of you, but Vader was firstly afraid of Obi-Wan Kenobi. We have done a video in the past about how Vader had actually been terrified of Obi-Wan during their duel on the Death Star. Despite the fact that Vader spent the better part of a decade hunting this particular Jedi Master, he was still very much afraid of him. Vader had nightmares of their duel on Mustafar many times, and even though he would consistently turn to pain and fear into rage in order to fuel his power, there was a part of Anakin that was still very much afraid of Obi-Wan's skill. Not to mention the fact that Obi-Wan was able to beat him already. The fact that Kenobi had been able to outlast and outsmart a young and very powerful chosen one back in the day left Darth Vader with a certain spike of fear within his heart whenever he thought of Kenobi. However, this fear was quickly overshadowed by pure hatred. In his mind, he wondered that since he couldn't defeat Obi-Wan on his full power and with a better body, how could he hope to face the Jedi Master in his current, more limited state? These questions burned within Vader's mind along with rage, and he would devote himself of every single day to honing his skill to perfection. With every Jedi he cut down, he constantly compared their skill to Kenobi's and matched his skill to boot. Eventually, when he was forced to give up his search on Obi-Wan, Vader didn't pay him any more mind for a while, although he would still reminisce that he wouldn't be able to get his revenge. This was until Obi-Wan quite literally came to him another decade later on the Death Star. Vader's iconic line, I feel a presence, a presence I haven't felt since, and his voice trails off before he sharply turns and strides off to find Kenobi as he meets him lightsaber in hand, rage fueled within his heart, but fear still held his grip. Of course, Darth Vader is set to face off against Obi-Wan Kenobi in the Obi-Wan series. Still, this does not change the fact that Darth Vader does hold some fear and respect for Obi-Wan, even though he's the individual that he hates most in the galaxy besides himself. When he faced Vader on the Death Star again, questions raced through his mind. Questions like, after all these years, why has he come now? Does he know something that I do not? Does he have a power that I do not wield? Can I defeat him? 
However, after the two prodded each other's defenses and had a few paces with the lightsaber, Vader's realization came to him. Ben Kenobi was a shadow of his former self and no longer held the skill and power of the general of the Clone Wars. Your powers are weak, old man. I feel as though that line was more of an outward realization than a taunt to Obi-Wan. I feel as though Darth Vader finally realized that he could defeat Obi-Wan in that moment, and he certainly did. But after his saber struck true, and he found himself simply cutting through the robes of his former master, the fear returned yet again. He wondered if it had all been a trick, or perhaps Kenobi was already dead, and he had just been fighting a specter of his imagination. In Darth Vader's final moment with Kenobi, where he was set to feel a massive wave of triumph and victory over the Jedi Master, all that he was left with was the same fear. The second individual that Vader feared should come as no surprise, but of course it was none other than the Emperor Darth Sidious himself. However, in the psyche of Darth Vader, there is still very much a twist here, and Vader did not fear him for the reasons that many of you may think. Yes, the Emperor held great power in the Force, and could easily overwhelm the Dark Lord of the Sith and Vader with his Force Lightning, but these were feats that Vader mostly respected more than anything else. Darth Vader feared more the prospect of actually losing Palpatine whether by the Emperor's death or by his own removal from service. Vader, of course, lost it all previously. After losing Padme and the Jedi Order, Vader felt that without the Emperor, he would have nothing left. He would be nothing, a man with no purpose, should Sidious go. Vader felt that so would his own purpose in this galaxy. His status in the Empire and his mission out to do the Emperor's bidding would all crumble. We have to remember that after the collapse of the Jedi Order and the death of Padme, this is all of Vader's purpose in one location and in one person. And should Sidious eventually die, so would all of these things for Vader. And this is why Vader was so deathly afraid of Palpatine, not because of his sheer command over the Force or knowledge over the dark side, but because of the fear of losing him. These prospects are what Darth Sidious had convinced Vader of when he was trying to get his apprentice to get out of his oppressive slump. Very early on in Darth Vader's career, when he was first within his suit, Vader was incredibly depressed and grew increasingly more withdrawn from everything and everyone around him. Finding more comfort and camaraderie with his stormtroopers, as they too were forced to wear helmets. Eventually, Palpatine ordered that his apprentice needed to stop moping around and focus on the future of the Empire. By harnessing his pain into rage, he would become strong and lead the Empire into greater heights. By giving Darth Vader these assignments to do exactly that, he would start to associate his purpose with his service to the Empire and his service to Palpatine. Vader's psyche is a broken one, and he does not fear things in a traditional sense as anybody else would. Many Sith Lords held great fear in the past, but Vader seemed as though he wasn't deterred by anything besides the prospect of losing what he was still able to hold dear to. And unfortunately, in the broken man, in the broken heart of Darth Vader, the only thing that this old crippled man had was the Empire was Palpatine, was the prospect of gaining more power and serving his emperor more efficiently. He didn't love Palpatine by any sense of the word, but Darth Vader did feel as though he needed him, and he needed the Empire to feel purpose, to feel anything at all. The Empire was the instrument through which Darth Vader enacted his revenge on the galaxy that had wronged him so many times. This was the means for his psyche to not break completely and for him to be nothing more than a crippled old man, with no power or purpose to speak of. But anyway, students of the Force, what do you think of this? Do you think that Vader truly feared anything at all, or anyone at all? And did either of these two characters have any surprise for you? What other character studies would you like to see in the future, and what aspects of Vader's psyche would you like to see more delved into on the channel? As of course, the Dark Lord returns in Obi-Wan Kenobi. Comment below your video ideas and requests, and as always, may the Force be with you, and we hope that you have a great day. Darth Vader struck fear into the hearts of both the Rebels and the Imperial officers alike. However, behind the mask, the Fallen Chosen One carried a lot of emotional baggage and was constantly in obscene amounts of pain, a pain that would hit him the hardest during his first few weeks in the suit. Welcome friends to today's video, where we will be taking a peek inside of Darth Vader's mind at the very beginning of it all, beginning directly after the events of Revenge of the Sith, exploring Darth Vader was up to, what he was feeling, and how the transformation from Anakin Skywalker to Lord of the Sith was well underway. For this video, we will be using the now legend 
Legends novel Dark Lord The Rise of Darth Vader, in order to understand everything Vader was going through, we must begin with detailing the suit's functions in regards to his injuries, as well as Anakin's adjustments to them. The suit and his medical issues tie directly into the functioning mental state which played a huge part in how he went about his business at the start of the Empire. At the end of each of Vader's severed limbs was bulbs of synthetic flesh that connected him to his robotic limbs as movement was triggered by a module that was connected with his nerve endings. On his chest, the respirator was connected to a breathing apparatus and heartbeat regulator inside of him. The ventilator was connected by tubes into his lungs and his throat so that he could breathe without using his mouth which was where the iconic breathing sound was born. All of this because the burns from Mustafar were so severe that it had charred him both externally as well as internally. Inside his mask, the goggles filtered out light, as to not cause his already damaged retinas any further harm. Furthermore, Vader's eardrums had been melted beyond repair, so to compensate, the helmet was equipped with implants that went into his inner ear, where sound waves had to be directly transmitted into Vader's brain. Wearing the suit was an extremely unpleasant experience. Due to his failure on Mustafar, Sidious punished him by using substandard and obsolete material when crafting Vader's suit. The results were horrific. The inside of the suit wasn't properly lined, which caused the cables and armor plating hooks to painfully catch and snag on his loose flesh and joints when he moved. His boots didn't properly fit his body and were cumbersome and heavy, so heavy that when he was first in the suit, he felt as if he were too rooted into the ground. Also, due to his raised heels, it was all he could do to make sure that he didn't topple over when he was walking. His artificial limbs and digits were sometimes slow to respond, and because of his pectoral armor, he could barely lift his arms over his head without extreme pain. The audio implants we mentioned earlier were also poorly designed, as they didn't filter out ambient noise, and as a result, Vader would often hear a lot of feedback. Due to this, it was difficult to determine the distance or direction of certain sounds and sometimes small noises. These small noises in return would cause an echoing or a vibrating effect. If this wasn't enough, the buttons on the regulator panel on his chest would beep at random and for seemingly no reason. During his first few weeks, Vader also mentioned that he felt claustrophobic within the black shell. Sleep rarely came to the put-upon Dark Lord. If it did, it was plagued by horrible dreams and the incessant noise caused by his new body. Vader's suit was a prison, a prison from which he couldn't ever escape from more than a few hours. The only time he ever felt somewhat human again was when he was able to spare a little time to get out of his suit and float in a back to tank for a small while, or when he was able to take his helmet off in his meditation sphere. Vader also felt a bit more at home around his stormtroopers, as they too were bound by duty within their armor. When not thinking about his horrible existence within his suit, Vader spent most of his early thought life dwelling on Padme, thinking about what could have been, and ruining every day that went by that he failed to find where his old master Kenobi was hiding. Vader thought many times about what would have happened if Padme had just accepted what he was trying to do for them. He envisioned the two of them sitting upon the throne of Coruscant, ruling the galaxy as it should be ruled along alongside their children. Anakin had planned to overthrow and destroy Palpatine, living in peace as the end-all be-all superior being of the Force. No Jedi, no Sith, just the Chosen One. But all of that was gone, because of Obi-Wan's ignorance, because of Padme's naivety, and because of Sidious. While it was true he wanted nothing more than to inflict every bit of torment and pain that he was going through onto Obi-Wan, it was Sidious who had manipulated him. Sidious who had punished and imprisoned him with this black cage of armor. Insidious, who now had gained everything, while Vader had lost everything. Vader would dwell on these thoughts for lengthy periods of time. Because of this, he grew melancholy. He moped around his Star Destroyer between missions. All of this pain and anguish he went through built up and only fueled his inner darkness. This darkness was unleashed only when he had the pleasure of hunting down Jedi survivors of Order 66. His only outlet was being able to cut down the Jedi in his path. Though at first, this too proved to be a challenge. When he was freshly in his suit about four weeks after the events of Mustafar, he found himself battling his first Jedi Knight within his new armor. He had a difficult time for a moment against the Knight, as he had not yet adapted his lightsaber style to that of his armor. The Jedi ended up getting a hit on Vader's arm. After this, Vader soon dispatched and beheaded the Jedi, but was deeply disturbed by what had taken place. No other with a lightsaber had so much as touched him besides that of Master Obi-Wan Kenobi and Count Dooku. 
and yet these mere Jedi Knights had somehow gotten through his defenses. Vader would go on to adapt to his lightsaber form to include some aspects of Makashi to function better with his limited movement, while retaining the power of Dejem So, his favorite form is Anakin. In fact, over time, Vader included more aspects of all the forms to ensure the most effective way of fighting for his new body, specifically tailored to it. He became a formidable and indomitable opponent, cutting down one Jedi after the next with the help of his Inquisitors. Over the ensuing months, Vader began to grow more accustomed to his suit and was able to control his movements much more efficiently. He modified the pistons in his own arm to where he'd be able to lift a fully grown man off the floor very easily. Heretofore, he had most often been operating in the shadows until the Emperor felt he was ready to be released to the public eye. Soon enough, Lord Vader made his debut to both the public at large as well as the Galactic Empire. Officers feared him and stormtroopers respected him. Towering at a staggering 6 feet 8 inches, he could silence a room with his very presence, and no one had seen anything like Vader before. Not since General Grievous of the Clone Wars. In our last video, we talked a little bit about the Sith skill of Dun Mok, a psychological warfare used to disconnect an opponent from the Force by instilling doubt and fear by way of insults or belittling speech. Well, Darth Vader was able to achieve Dun Mok within the first few minutes of meeting a Jedi without saying a word perhaps being the best utilizer of the ability in all of Star Wars. Vader's bloodlust for Jedi was insatiable, so much so that Sidious had to tell him to stop hunting them. In his opinion, Lord Sidious already considered their victory absolute. For over a thousand years, the Sith had to hide in the shadows, and he wanted the Jedi to know what he felt like while watching the Republic crumble to ash. He was under the impression that Vader needed to focus, focus more on Imperial tasks, and leave the Jedi slaying to the Inquisitors. Vader, however, didn't listen, and kept pursuing Jedi on his own time. This hunting would go on up until he was led to the planet of Kashyyyk. There, the Imperials had planned an invasion to capture as many Wookiees as possible to use as slaves to build the first Death Star. Six Jedi were also being kept under their protection as the invasion commenced, this marking one of Darth Vader's most important moments of his entire life. Vader went down and slayed all of the Jedi within his path, as they were astonished and overwhelmed by his power. Jedi Master Roan Shrine went down to confront Vader in a surprise attack on the Sith Lord. The battle was fierce, with the Jedi Master able to land a few hits on the seemingly insurmountable Dark Lord. During the fight, Vader gave in more and more to the dark side until he stopped fighting with his lightsaber and dismantled the Jedi Master with the Force alone. Master Shrine, beaten and near death, spat insults at Vader, telling him that he was controlled by the Emperor and that he'd be betrayed just as the Jedi had been. Then, Darth Vader chose to reveal who the Emperor really was, as well as who he really was to the dying Jedi before allowing him to ultimately succumb to the Force and his injuries. In this moment of revelry, the dark side was strong with Vader, and at that moment, the suit seemed little more to him than garments, and the Jedi seemed little more to him than small interferences. He had finally found himself, and he knew his true purpose, to bring order to the Empire. Darth Vader, Dark Lord of the Sith, left Kashyyyk with a newfound understanding of himself, as well as the dark side. He would then go on to cause more terror and tyranny in the galaxy, until such a day as the Rebellion rose to face him. So my friends, what did you think of today's video? suit has many horrific and disturbing elements to it that you would never even know were there unless you took a deeper look into the lore of the Star Wars mythos and really analyzed exactly how someone like Darth Vader could endure such a devastating encounter and then be able to return and function following. Simply by watching the films, many of the most disturbing and painful elements of Vader's suit and cybernetics are completely glanced over, such as the fact that Vader's vocal cords are so damaged that even by speaking without the aid of his helmet, it causes him excruciating pain and is nearly impossible. And yet, the Sith Lord Darth Vader is one of the most powerful characters we have ever seen in the history of the Star Wars galaxy. Today though, I wanted to touch on one of the most disturbing elements of Vader's suit, and in the following days, we will be releasing several videos that detail the most horrific and nightmare-inducing elements of Darth Vader's cybernetics. For starters, I wanted to begin with the most painful part of Darth Vader's Sue, that being his cybernetics. In order to use his cybernetics properly, Darth Vader had to undergo several surgeries without anesthetics that would scar the dark
Dark Lord for the rest of his existence. In order for Vader to use his cybernetics properly, including his fingers and legs, he needed them to be connected to his brain. What this meant is that medical droids had to open up the skull and spine of Vader and surgically insert neural needles into them. Without these, Vader would be forced to manipulate his cybernetics only by using the Force, which was possible, but at the same time extremely taxing. So taxing in fact that Vader could only do so for a very limited amount of time. Unfortunately for Vader, these neural needles were also not a permanent part of the Dark Lord, as they were attached to the interior of Vader's helmet. What this meant is that every time Vader put on his helmet, these needles would again attach to Vader's skull in order to connect with his brain, and also connect with Vader's spine in order to connect his brain functions to the rest of his body. What this surgery essentially did was allow Vader to use his cybernetics just as he would normal limbs, as they were controlled by the functionality of his brain. Nonetheless though, in order to do this, each time Vader put on his helmet, the needles would be forcefully inserted into the head and neck of the Dark Lord. Because of this, Vader could also feel pain within his cybernetics, as we saw in Return of the Jedi when Luke Skywalker cuts the Dark Lord's hand off. Despite being extremely advanced, the process was also imperfect. Because they were not his real limbs and the connection was imperfect, his cybernetics would often snag on his living tissue. And each time they snagged, Vader's entire body would be jolted with intense pain. But that was the most painful aspect of Darth Vader's suit, and how every time he had to put on his helmet, painful needles would be inserted into his brain and neck. Leave in the comments below what you think of this little detail and the fact that this is how Darth Vader connected with his cybernetics. I 